Heavenly Father, we lift up to you all of the needs that exist in our families, among our friends, and in this world. We pray for your healing touch. We pray for your presence in the midst of people suffering so that they will know that you, the God who has experienced everything that we go through, including death itself, um, is by our sides. Uh, Lord, we pray that we would uh, at all times reach up to you in the name of Jesus to have you not only as our Savior and Lord and God and King, but as our companion and our best friend. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would guide my words in our time together and that it would all bring glory to you. We pray for healing for Brian and for Coulter, for Carrie, for Gino, for Jeannie, for Woody, for all who are in need of your healing touch. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Linda. All right, tonight we are uh, moving on to Article 10 of the Augsburg Confession, and it deals with the Lord's Supper. Um, and this is where um, things get interesting. Um, later on in the confession, uh, Melanchthon is going to deal with some of the specificity of how uh, the specifics of how Lutherans view Holy Communion. Um, I just want to look at several biblical passages here, and then um, I'm thinking we'll move on to um, Article 11 on Confession, and I'm prepared to move on to uh, Article 12, which is on repentance, although because it's such a central uh, flashpoint in the conflict between Lutheran and Roman Catholic theologians, if we do get to it tonight, it will only be a beginning. So let's move along here to Article 10, dealing with the Lord's Supper. Our churches teach that the body and blood of Christ are truly present and distributed to those who eat the Lord's Supper. They reject those who teach otherwise. So it's very short, very succinct. And Eck, the Roman Catholic theologian who responded to this, offered uh, no disapproval. Um, but, of course, there are details, which is, uh, has to do with the difference in understanding of what goes on in Holy Communion. Now, my notes in my edition of uh, the uh, Augsburg Confession say transubstantiation, consubstantiation, or any other human speculation asks the wrong question. And that wrong question is, how is Christ present in the bread and wine? Lutheranism has no theory or philosophical explanation of how Christ is present. Rather, Lutherans insist on answering the what of the Lord's Supper. We believe, teach, and confess that of the bread, Christ said, this is my body, and of the wine, this is my blood. In other words, is means is. But what Lutherans haven't really gotten into, you sometimes, and I've, I've I've used this term, consubstantiation, um, simply as a way of contrasting the Roman Catholic position and the Protestant position on the Lord's Supper. Um, let me write these terms or put these terms in the comments. The first is transubstantiation. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. The other term is consubstantiation. Uh, this term is most usually associated with the Lutheran position, although the confessions don't actually get into what these terms are supposed to address. I'm coming to it, I promise. And the final term I want to mention is representation or symbolization. So we've got a bunch of Asians here. A-T-I-O-N-S. So, 
Um, I'm reading now from uh, the Senior Catechism by Dell um, in talking about these varied positions on Holy Communion, and then we'll take a look at the biblical passages. I want to take a full look at those. Um, so it, it says the, the doctrine of some Reformed denominations, and that would mean non-Lutheran Protestants, right? The doctrine of some of these uh, Reformed denominations is that the Lord's Sep Supper is only a memorial feast. They eat bread and drink wine and remember Christ's death. To them, it is not a sacrament which gives the treasures of the gospel. According to their belief, they receive only bread and wine. So um, the idea there is uh, that they do not believe that it's a sacrament. Or if they use the term sacrament, it's not as we understand it. Remember, our understanding of a sacrament is that it was instituted by Christ, that it imparts the forgiveness of sins, and that it involves um, a physical element being met by the Word of God. And for Lutherans, that clearly applies to holy baptism and holy communion. Um, and we believe that, as, as I say, it imparts forgiveness. What that denotes is that it is uh, Christ's action or God's action, and do God does something in it. So um, that position would be characterized by representation or symbolism. This represents for them the body. This represents for them the blood, rather than being this is the body, this is the blood. And this becomes important when uh, you do not hold to the belief that a sacrament is something that God does, then it turns into our work. And when we turn a, a, a sacrament into our work, uh, like baptism or Holy Communion, we turn it into something I'm doing, I'm deciding to do this, and not taking the Lord at his word for what he's doing in the sacrament, you're really buying into a kind of works righteousness. That would be the Lutheran position. Um, where you're basically saying, I'm doing this for the Lord, rather than the Lord doing this for you, giving himself to you, giving forgiveness to you. Um, and uh, that's, that's really a consequential difference, a consequential understanding. Uh, it takes the gospel right out of the sacrament, because we believe that in both the sacraments, the gospel word comes to us, Christ comes to us, the Holy Spirit comes to us. All right, so that's um, kind of a human-centered, representational or uh, symbolic understanding of Holy Communion. Now, another category is uh, body and blood only. Roman Catholics believe that by the consecration the bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ, which is transubstantiation, which means a change in the substance. By the way, I, I left out an S. It's T-R-A-N-S-S. -S -S. <laughs> but it's the idea, you know, tran means to move, as in transport or whatever. It's the idea of the, the, the substance of the bread and wine actually changing into body and blood. So, uh, but uh, St. Paul calls the bread of the sacrament bread even after the consecration. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, a passage we looked at last night, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? With that one sentence, the apostle condemns uh, this false doctrine that this a bread changes. In other words, Lutherans are willing to accept the mystery of it. We're willing to accept that Christ says, this is my body, 
This is my blood, while it's still remaining bread and wine, if you did a chemical analysis. But also based on this passage of Romans 10, 16, in which Paul says the body is the bread, right? We, we need to be willing to understand the mystery of how God might work. The other thing that, uh, and, and this is going to come into play in the next several articles of the um, uh, confession, is the difference of the understanding of what happens when the words of institution, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, etc. The difference in understanding of what happens between Lutherans and Roman Catholics. Lutherans, it should be said, uh, and Roman Catholics are closer together than, say, Lutherans are to Methodists or Presbyterians or others on this matter of Holy Communion. This is why Eck, in responding to the Article 10 of the Confession, didn't offer any objections when uh, it said simply that we teach that the body and blood of Christ are truly present and distributed to those who eat the Lord's Supper. There would be no basis for objection to that. Um, Lutherans just don't get into the how of that. But here's another difference. Uh, the Mass in the Roman Catholic Church um, believes that the consecrated elements are now body and blood of Christ um, and are not immediately distributed to the congregation, but are offered to God by the priest for the sins of the people. In other words, and this is, this is still true of Roman Catholic theology, there is a belief that Christ is being offered up again his body and blood are being offered up again uh, in sacrifice. That what happens at Holy Communion is another sacrifice. Well, this run, runs contrary to the teaching which we ran into in Hebrews, that Christ sacrificed himself once and for all. So those are the big differences that exist between the Roman Catholic and Lutheran positions. Now, I want to... Uh, be true to what we're talking about here and look at the biblical background of what Lutherans believe. So take a look, um, first of all, at uh, Matthew 26, to, uh, 26, 26 to 29. Matthew 26, 26 to 29. We're going to look at the four accounts of Holy Communion that appear in the New Testament which appear in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians. So, Matthew 26, 26 to 29. This is during the Last Supper, and it says, Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Notice the operative verb there, this is. Jesus doesn't say this represents. Now, it is still in form, bread it is still in form. Wine still tastes like wine, still tastes like bread, still is. But it also is body and blood. It is a both and kind of thing. And after all, Jesus is God. He can do things that we don't fully understand. All right, take a look at another account of Holy Communion. Mark 14, verses 22 to 25. Now, it's interesting because Mark, you know, is the guy who is uh, the breathless journalist. I call him the Wolf Blitzer of, uh, uh, of the gospel writers because he delivers this good news so breathlessly and quickly. And yet he spends a good three, four verses on this subject of Holy Communion. So I went the wrong way. Luke 12. 42, 
wait a minute, I led you the wrong direction. 14, 22, 25. I'll get there. Mark 14, 22 to 25. Mark 14, 22 to 25. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. All right. So again, the verb is is uh, not represent or symbolize. Take a look at Luke 22, 19 to 20. Luke 22, 19 to 20. And Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And by the way, I've talked about this word before, but the word that's used, translated there as remembrance, is the Greek word anamnesis, which has the idea not of remembering as recalling, but be, being remembered to remembered to again so do this to be re, uh, remembered with me again and then it says um, verse 20 and likewise the cup after they had eaten saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood uh, and notice Luke makes a point of saying after that but behold the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table Think of this. Judas received the sacrament. All right. I always find that a stunning thought. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth about the importance of the Lord's Supper. And he writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So once again, he is using is. Um, this is for you. Uh, very important because what it denotes is that Christ actually comes to us in the bread and the wine, that his body and blood come to us in, with, and under the bread and the wine. And um, because of that, it's, it has this uh, impartation of his word, and it is sacramental in that it brings the forgiveness of sins. So that's the Lutheran understanding in a nutshell. Um, by the way, this um, understanding of uh, Holy Communion on the part of Roman Catholics was decided on at a council of the church known as the Fourth Lateran Council, which was convoked in 1213 and completed its work in 1215. So it had been the position of the Roman Catholic Church by this time for more than 300 years when Melanchthon wrote that <clears throat> the bread turns into the body, the blood turns into the wine, and this is why you have... Um, the tabernacles near the altar at Roman Catholic churches because um, it remains for them the body and blood and they they keep it. Whereas our understanding has more to do and we have some fuzziness in our understanding about this by the way which I think I've probably talked about before but our understanding is that it is a function of the word that causes the bread to be body and the blood uh, to be wine. But 
um, you know, does that mean it's always for, and forever? That that's a, that's another question. But in terms of the question of the substance, we still believe that it is body in with and under the bread, and blood in with and under the wine. Okay. All right, and I think we look, we'll take a quick look at 1 Corinthians 10, 16, since your Bibles are probably turned there in 1 Corinthians anyway. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, which is mentioned there in the uh, brackets. Uh, by the way, all the biblical citations that appear within the body of the confession, you know, um, they're in brackets because uh, they were not originally um, written in there. Uh, these were added by later editors just to show what Melanchthon may have been referring to. So 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? We actually participate in Christ's body and blood. That's the isness of it. But it's still, as he says here, the bread that we break, even though it's the body, right? So in with and under. All right, I hope that's perfectly clear as mud. All right, now let's move on to confession. Um, and this is, a, uh, I think, a really good and interesting article. Um, by the way, uh, I'm going to come back to that Fourth Lateran Council here in just a few moments. Uh, and I have that article, Wikipedia article, on the Fourth Lateran Council in your comments. All right, so here's Article 11 on confession. Our churches teach that private absolution should be retained in the churches, although listing all sins is not necessary for confession. For according to the Psalms, this is Psalm 19, 12, um, it is impossible who can discern his errors. Now, uh, we come again to the Fourth Lateran Council, uh, uh, question raised by that. When Melanchthon says that the Lutheran churches retained private absolution, that meant that they retained the practice of allowing people to come in and confess their sins privately to their pastor. And if you look um, in most Lutheran uh, worship or hymnal books, hymns, hymn books, books of worship, there are sections uh, that specifically are set, uh, specifically set out private confession. So I have had people from time to time who've come in for counseling and have wanted to privately confess their sins. Um, this is not a matter of the pastor or priest um, uh, taking the place of God. This is simply doing in private what we off, what we do every time we worship together um, communally, and that is a person uh, will come and confess their sins. Now, Usually, in individual confession and absolution, um, although it can be general, um, usually the person is coming in about a specific issue when they talk to a pastor or a priest, and so they will want to talk about a particular sin that is troubling them that they want to seek God's forgiveness for. And what Melanchthon says is we've retained this practice, but... The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, in Canon 21, <laughs> it was div divided into sections known as canons, Canon 21 said that once a year, all Christians needed to go and confess all their sins to the parish priest. And they needed to try uh, to name them all. Well, uh, there, that's where Psalm uh, 19 comes in. Who can discern his errors? We come to God, remember, based on Psalm 139, uh, verses 23 and 24, and we ask God to show us the sins we're not aware of, show us our secret sins. We want to know, 
right? So that we can repent for them. But when, uh, because we're human and we don't remember everything, we ask God uh, to forgive us for our failure to love God, which is the first table of the Ten Commandments, and love our neighbor, which is the second table of the Ten Commandments. So um, God understands that we are human beings. Our memories can be faulty. Uh, we may not understand something to be a sin at any given time, but as we come to God with a, a repentant heart and confess our sins, there are times when God will show us that where we have erred, where we have walked away from his will. So um, where the requirement to come in once a year uh, would have come in, that's a very kind of religious requirement. You know, you've got to do this once a year and you've got to remember all your sins. That's just not biblical. But what about this whole business of confessing our sins um, generally? Let's talk about that first. Take a look at Proverbs 28.13. Proverbs 28.13. Because this is going to talk about what confession is all about for us. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. To confess them and to say, I don't want to do them anymore. So Jesus says to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. If we don't walk away from confessing our sins to the Lord with the intention of not um, committing that sin again, then we probably truly haven't repented. But So that's why confession is important. Uh, if we conceal our transgressions, we will not prosper. And I think Proverbs uses that more in terms of m moving along faithfully and well in our life with God, not so much about money. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Right? We will obtain mercy when we're able to honestly confess and acknowledge our sins and leave them behind. Hmm? Uh, God will honor that. Now take a look at another passage. Uh, 1 John 1, 8-9. This is very, very familiar. We've looked at it together before, but it's okay. 1 John 1, 8-9. It says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness when we confess our sin. Now, what about confessing to other people? Take a look at James 5, 16. James 5, 16. That is, coming to someone and acknowledging our sin. Maybe it wasn't something, not, not a sin we committed against them, but acknowledging a sin that is bothering us to another Christian or to a pastor or to a priest. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So the idea here is to uh, take advantage of the opportunity with mature Christian believers to honestly acknowledge our own sins to one another so that we can be forgiven and so that uh, our prayers will be honored because we will be covered again in Christ's righteousness. Um, so uh, 
this is a really good thing. I remember years ago there was a man I knew, Jewish, who had been through some tough stuff and, um, and had done some tough stuff. And just unexpectedly, we're just sitting around talking one night, and he just unloads on me all these things that um, had, where he felt his life had gone awry. And uh, I, I just listened. You know, I wasn't his pastor, obviously. He wasn't a practicing uh, Jew. Um, but I'll never forget what he said to me as I got ready to leave his house that night, I just been over for, I don't even remember why I happened to be at his house. Um, it was for some other reason. And he, he thumped me on the shoulder and he said, thank you. He said, I've read that confession is good for the soul. <laughs> and so um, when you have someone, uh, a trusted Christian, to whom you can entrust your sins. You don't want to go blabbing to everybody. Uh, you know, the Christian life is not meant to be uh, an excuse for gossip. Someone you trust, someone you know who will maintain confidentiality, who will not use your confession as a weapon against you in one way, shape, or form but will honor the, um, the confidentiality. And most often, that's probably going to be a pastor. Um, that can be a very helpful thing. Uh, you know, you've got someone else who has got your back before the Lord, who also can just as the pastor does on Sunday mornings, proclaim God's absolution. You are absolved of your sin. You are forgiven. And that is a wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, so t tomorrow we're going to talk about repentance. Um, and in that case, we'll get into the two parts of repentance, which involves the confession of sin and contrition and so forth. But I imagine we'll spend uh, tomorrow just on the, the article um, 12 on repentance. So I hope this has been helpful on article uh, 10 and Article 11, the Lord's Supper and Confession. And uh, I guess there are a bunch of other things I could look at, but we'll just stick with that. All right, I hope that's helpful. So let's pray together now. Father, we do confess to you our sins all of the ways in which we have failed to love you completely, all of the ways in which we have failed to love others as we love ourselves. We pray that for the sake of Christ, you would forgive us and cover us with his righteousness. Give us a sense every time we bring our sins before you honestly and with true repentance and true faith in Christ, that you do forgive us, and you do cover us in grace, and we can be confident each and every day of your gracious love for us. We are human. It is our nature to sin. We pray, Lord, that you would protect us from using that as an excuse for deliberate sin, and grant, God, that we would honor you in all ways, at all times, in all things. And when we come before you, we pray that you would graciously show us the ways in which we err, but grant that we also, if we don't perceive everything, that we won't impose a guilt upon us that you don't want us to bear. 
you are our gracious, loving God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And we cling to you for grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, I'll plan on seeing you here tomorrow evening, Lord willing, at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, I hope that you have a good night's sleep. God bless. Bye.